to my mind. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to, to, to speak. Um, as Chris said, I'm a, a general surgeon here. As most of you know, I've had an interest in trauma for a while in terms of surgical trauma and, and teaching as well. Um, this is a, hopefully you'll find an interesting talk. I don't think there'll be a great deal to sort of remember from it, but there's a few sort of interesting features about trauma in the provinces because at the end of the day, we all, or most of us here will work in the provinces. It's a talk that I've, I've given a few times over quite a few years, so some of the, the features may be a little bit uh, old, including the first one, which is apparently a picture of potpourri, because this is a bit of a, a potpourri of sort of interesting facts, some of which you may find rather boring, some of which hopefully a little bit more interesting, and then maybe one or two that might provoke a few thoughts. So it's, it's quite a, um, a busy talk, hopefully it won't go on too long. What constitutes the, the provinces, some of the features of the population in the provinces, because all of these have bearing on how we deal with trauma, and some of the mechanisms, the workload, just a rough idea of the numbers, the workload that it creates, and, and from that, some of the issues. So it's not solutions to any problems, it's just a little bit of a, uh, an overview. This was a definition I found in one of the dictionaries, what is the provinces, but if you read a little bit further down, it says we're all unsophisticated, unpolished, or narrow-minded. I don't think it's quite true, because we do have cafes, we know our lattes from our long blacks, so I think we're, we're reasonably civilised. How much of New Zealand is actually in, in the provinces and rural? And so I've, I've lumped rural and provinces together. Um, about 53%, so just uh, over half of us, actually live outside the, the big red blobs of Auckland, Christchurch, Dunedin, Wellington, uh, and the like. So, you know, it's a good proportion uh, of the population. Now, obviously, in different countries, rurality means different things, different distances from major centres and differences, therefore, from services, and that's important. There are a whole variety of differences, as you can imagine, of rural population um, characteristics compared with uh, more, their more urban counterparts in terms of health, employment, education, age demographics. And one of the big things we know in, or in Northland is the, um, the deprivation index. Now, we know that uh, I think we're the second highest, lowest deprivation, if you see what I mean. Um, and that obviously has a bearing on services and a bearing on the ability of the, the region in general to provide those services, not just in hospital we're talking about here, but outside hospital, maybe even more so. The current population of Northland, I think, is about 172,000 now, um, so we're three, between 3 and 4% of New Zealand population. Um, 72,000, I think, live in the greater Whangarei area, so most of the population that we deal with is, uh, still drains into this hospital from even more rural than, uh, than, than, uh, than Whangarei itself. We have a slightly higher proportion of, of young people compared with New Zealand. As you can imagine, other provincial areas, I say Tauranga, but that's probably more metropolitan now, they will have a higher proportion of older populations. So again, that's a slightly different demand. Um, and our post-school education is significantly lower than, than in the rest of uh, Northland, the rest of New Zealand, rather. Um, we do have a higher unemployment rate. This, these figures are slightly improved now in the in sort of the latest figures, but it just gives you that, that idea. Um, and our workforce is slightly different. More outdoor work, maybe more high risk work, as I've said then, forestry and agriculture um, comprising quite a, a, a significant proportion of the, the workforce. We have a, a lower average income, higher single parent families, and a much higher proportion of, uh, of Maori by, D, by population for the DHB. And I think we're probably again about the second highest Maori proportion um, population for any of the DHBs, um, which has points that obviously mean increased amounts of comorbid factors, but other very good points, the increased amount of uh, whānau support. We do live in a beautiful area, and I'll pop these slides up every now and again to remind us why we, why li we all live, choose, or look, most of us here, choose to live up here. Seasonal fluctuations in, uh, in the provinces are probably more so than in, in rural areas. Um, we obviously get a lot more tourists at certain times of the year, both local and overseas, which can have bearings on how people drive and things like that. And that leads in itself to increased trauma demands, as the graph shows at the bottom, um, over for particularly the summer months, so January, February, March, and then building up around November, December. The increased amount of road vehicle trauma will happen more at those times. Certain high-risk recreational activities where you can meet the locals. Uh, we don't have bungee jumping here. I don't think we have anything high enough, but you know, certain more high-risk things that we see. There are certain non-demographic factors that will have a bearing on trauma that rolls in through the doors. Now, because motor vehicle accidents always comprise uh, a lot of major trauma that we see, roads are important. 
we've got six and a half thousand kilometres of roads, but not many of them, proportionally, are sealed when you compare them with New Zealand. Potentially, these are far more winding roads. And as we'll see in a few, few slides, that actually has an indication on the amount of road trauma that we, that we get. Uh, we don't seem to drive that fast in provincial New Zealand. That may be due because we've got winding roads. But if you go down to sort of the Waikato, some of the hospitals around there, the, the open speed road there, the speed on the open road there will be much, much higher, as you can imagine, with the straight roads. We um, don't have particularly high seatbelt usage up here, and we've all seen the traumas that have come in that have been ejected that haven't had their, their seatbelts on. Alcohol, always in the news about the, um, the amount of alcohol drunk and the amount of road crashes you have. Higher here, um, a much higher proportion of serious fatal um, injuries have alcohol on board. Um, some of the, these factors here I got from the, the police, and there's just a few graphs we can quickly look through. These are some of the major road safety issues that they've identified in North, Northland. So crashes on bends, winding roads, alcohol and speed, we've already shown that, and roadside hazards, and I don't think they're all, all sheep. Uh, so this just shows a, a few, few things, just with the slides, a few graphs on this slide, just for interest's sake, really. Um, about sort of two speed and alcohol being right up here together with poor handling. Um, and again, crashes down there, uh, mainly on bends, a high proportion on the bends, so losing control. Is that because we've got a higher proportion of metal roads? Possibly, possibly not. Um, so as for the individual types of trauma, just while we're on cars and car accidents, motor vehicle accidents, the highest proportion and the largest overall subgroup um, more so in the provinces than in the urban areas, probably because of speed-related things. Probably a lot more crashes in, um, in metropolitan areas, but low speed, low, um, low injury pattern that goes along with that. In Northland, as we see from that previous slide, we have around 20 deaths uh, a year um, from, uh, from motor vehicle accidents, um, which is higher than, than Auckland, but is lower than certain other areas, particularly Bay of Plenty and Canterbury and Southland. You can see those are the areas with long straight roads, so possibly higher speeds. If you're going to have a crash, you've got uh, a less chance of surviving them. Uh, and as you can see, again, the little figure down the bottom there, one out of 15 serious motor vehicle accidents in Northland uh, resulted in death, whereas compared with Auckland, it's only one in 50. Again, probably in relation to the sort of the speeds. Uh, this a whole set of other graphs just basically showing um, probably more, yeah, nothing particularly different from we've already talked about there, so I'll move on. Now those, those features tend to be more exaggerated the more rural you get. So when we're getting to the far north, there is a higher speeding and alcohol usage for the accidents that they get, and probably consequentially a higher serious injury and, and death rate. Some factors that may or may not have anything to do with that, time to detection, the relative isolation, transport issues further on to, and longer to transport. However, most accidents do tend to happen on the major highways, and you can see the red ones, which are the fatals, the predominant ones are up on State Highway 1, State Highway 12. Um, but most of them actually do happen on sort of roads with a, with a number, so they're sort of the larger roads despite that. So what about some of the impact uh, that all of this has on, on healthcare? Because that's really what we're more interested in. So it does impact on the type of trauma we get, the numbers of trauma we get, and maybe the timing of the trauma, so seasonal fluctuations, that sort of thing. Our patients may have a higher number of comorbidities, so that's going to impact on how we look after them. There's poorer social situations in general out there. Is there going to be increased demand on services, rehabilitation services, things like that when the patients get out of hospital? Yeah, these are all, like I said, just thoughts. And are the provinces, because of resource implications, are we a little bit less able to, to cope with all of that? Um, the figure that I got there was motor vehicles alone is 94 million. It's, it's a number at the end of the day, but it's just a, a big number. But we all still choose to live here because it is still nice to, to live here. Um, from the HQSC, so the Health and Quality um, <coughs> Committee, this is just showing where Northland sits in admissions due to, to trauma per, per 100,000. So we're above average on that. So we've got a darker colour purple. Um, and you can see the other provincial areas in the darker colour purple. You know, less than maybe some of the larger uh, metropolitan areas. In terms of sort of the death rates and mortality, we're actually right slap bang on the average, um, which is probably good. Do we get more trauma, do, but do we look after them better? Maybe. We all probably like to think so. We make them survive. But again, if you look at other rural areas, Taranaki um, in the southern region, then they've got a sort of a higher mortality from trauma. 
just for interest, I looked at some of the common mechanisms of, uh, of trauma just to see how we compare with, um, with the rest of New Zealand. And as you can imagine, for cyclists, Mr. Lang will be pleased to see that, we'd do better. Um, drownings, as you can imagine, were probably higher. Environmental factors, that's a whole nebulous group. I don't really know quite what that means. Uh, machinery, higher. Um, the best, best one, I think, is that we do better in overexertion. <laughs> Survive more overexertion, you know, whatever that may be. The motor vehicle accidents, again, they keep rearing their head much higher than, than on average in New Zealand. This was a, a reasonably controversial statement made quite a long time ago. It's, it's from America, this, but you know, rurality is an is a international feature. It says that rural residents are 50% more likely to die from trauma, trauma than their urban peers, which sounds terrible. Think, oh my goodness, why do we live you know, out of an urban centre? Because we're going to die as soon as we fall over. But they were able to extrapolate back and said that hospital volume, and therefore by extension rurality, because obviously a smaller hospital, less people tend to get admitted there, did not seem to affect the survival. So they thought that the rural care was as good as, or no worse, than, than urban counterparts. So therefore, the death rate could be attributable to gaining fast access to definitive care, which obviously has a bearing. Um, it's still nice to live in Northland, though. Uh, another reason for living in Northland, house prices, what you can buy in Auckland, you can buy up here, and <laughs> far better. Um, what actually turns up, the figures are probably not up to date, Scott will be able to tell me, but you can see we do get a lot of people running through ED, um, not sure, not that far, short of 40,000, uh, probably over that now, I suspect. The number of trauma calls per year depends a little bit on definitions, um, but you can see that you know, 300 to 400 a year, that's at least one a day, realistically, probably more so now. Um, we have about 60 major trauma admissions, again, again these, these are probably two years out, out of date, but 60 major trauma admissions, so an injury severity score greater than 15. Um, lots of minor trauma admissions. Not that many go on to get transferred straight to a tertiary centre, and that's mainly head because of what we have here. We all know about Fonray Base Hospital, where we, we live and work. Um, how many? This is just from the general surgical point of view, seven general surgeons, eight orthopaedics, but next week it might be nine, I don't know, they will seem to add, add to them. Um, we do have rural hospitals uh, that are all part of Northland DHB as well. What about the services that we offer that have some bearing on trauma? Well, general surgery, um, we're limited because we don't have vascular on site, we don't have neuron surgery. Paediatrics, plastics, very, very limited. Um, but we pro just about provide everything else. Orthopaedics, they always used to transfer out the complex pelvics, but that may be changing as, as new appointments come around. And radiology, which is very important. We're doing better now with CT scans because we've got two, but still, um, things like interventional and geography to stop bleeding um, is, is really very limited. Intensive care, we've got an intensive care unit with dedicated intensivists. ED, nine consultants we think now. Um, proximity to Auckland is important for, for us up here, and it's not just not just talking about Northland, but other provincial centres. So their, their proximity to their major centre is important. You know how far is too far to transfer patients, but we haven't. It doesn't take long to fly between the, between here and Auckland. So these are uh, sorry, I'm moving on quite fast, but just to get through things really, uh, these are just some of the thoughts that that I'd had about things um, about. What matters actually in trauma in the in the provinces? Some pre-hospital issues, as we said before, some of these accidents can be quite remote. They can be out in the middle of the forestry. We, we had one last year, I think, a, a very bad forestry injury that took ages to be extracted because of where it was, and it had probably a life-ending consequence to, to that particular patient. Hypothermia can become an issue. Bleeding, obviously, if it's continuing, can become an issue. So the time taken to recover the patient and the type of transport issues that, um, that stem from that are, are particularly important in how we manage trauma in the provinces, or particularly in rural areas at least. So is scoop and run less of an option? We've got to do more there because it will take longer to get the patient to hospital. As I said, these are just really thoughts. If we're going to need to do more at the scene, do we need to have more paramedics um, to be able to, to sort of deal with some of these things early on? Uh, Helicopters we use a lot in Northland, and I think we do it very well here, probably better than, than almost any other region in the, in the country. Once a patient gets to the hospital, what are some of the issues that we maybe have in a slightly smaller hospital compared to the big hospital? The trauma team, made up of a, a variety of specialties, if you've just got one, if the 
orthopedic surgeon or the general surgeon is busy in theatre, if ICU's got a sick patient, there's not many people that could actually come and help in ED. So that has a, a potential bearing. I've already mentioned imaging and no angiography. So that can make a difference how we have the potential to manage some intra-abdominal trauma, pelvic fractures and the like. Teleradiology was, at the time I initially put this together, was sort of starting to rear its head about maybe interacting more on, a, on an acute individual patient setting. Um, and telemedicine from that, you could still argue, has a role. I think we have been using it slightly more and more between Kaitaia and here, not necessarily so much between here and, and Auckland, but some of the, the more rural uh, hospitals to here. That really has a, has a bearing on significant things, might reduce discrepancies, might mean that the patient is treated by the physician up there the same as they would be down here by the physician that, that's sort of guiding treatment. Um, digital pictures, things like that, we all know that that can give you a lot of information, um, provided, of course, it works, which it doesn't always. Transfer of patients is important. We do move some patients on, the ones that we can't cope to here. Should we be transferring more if we feel we can't cope with them? I think we, being 180k from Auckland, it's, it's got that sort of slight tyranny, what I call tyranny of distance. We're just close enough to Auckland to be able to get them there reasonably quickly, but we're just far enough that it still will take a bit of extra time. So should they still come to the, to the regional hospital before they get transported on? How do we transfer them? Road, road or helicopter? When do they go? Do we sort them out here first and just send the twiddly bits down to Auckland? Or do we just patch them up and, and send them straight off? And we all know that better availability to actually get a patient you want to down there uh, does have a bearing. Some general surgical issues um, that I just thought of. Because we don't have things like vascular and neurosurgery, there is a potential for what I'd call the occasional specialist that will just have a go at it um, now because the patient's here in front of us, but we haven't done one of those for 10 years, but hey, look, how hard can it be? There's a book and there's Google and YouTube. Um, overall lower numbers that we get of trauma compared with somewhere like Auckland will reduce the experience um, of individual types of cases, but because we're on call more often, we actually probably catch up and, and um, go ahead of some of our um, more urban counterparts. We don't have a specific trauma service like they do in some of the big hospitals. When we're all on call, we all do trauma if it comes through the door. Um, and that can make, lead to a little bit of dilution of the, uh, of the, uh, the experience, but hey, we don't all want to be on call all of the time. Um, should we have one or two surgeons within the department that have an interest in trauma that can take the patient the next day or can be available on the phone? As I said, these are all just sort of thoughts about things. We need to have a good relationship with our tertiary centre. We do need to keep uh, updated with skills, and there are some very good courses out there that will help us to do that. We do have junior registrars as well as trainees here. Are the more junior trainees less able to cope? I don't think so, as long as they've got the support, and it's a great learning ground for it and experience as well. What about some of the other specialties? Well, again, because trauma, we don't get a sort of a vast number coming through, they will, they will also be seen as the occasional specialist in terms of the ward. You know, there'll be a trauma patient over there, another one maybe down there, and then they won't get another major one for a week or two. So the nurses don't build up that experience as well. And theatre staff, similarly, if we do have to do those weird and wonderful operations every now and again, someone will have to go to the back room and dust the brush, dust the, um, dust, the dust off the, the, the craniotomy set, for example. Um, but there are courses out there for the nurses to keep them current as well, which are all, all useful. Trauma may change in the future. Um, vehicle safety issues, we've all seen probably a significant reduction in the amount of uh, uh, significant motor vehicle trauma because of airbags, side intrusion bars, all the sort of things. Um, trauma may change in its pattern. Do we in the provinces see a slightly different pattern of disease compared with um, met metropolitan trauma? Is it a different disease? Is that going to impact on training? You know, if you're going to finish your surgical training and go and practice in a major centre where there's a trauma team available, where there's a, um, there's a dedicated trauma theatre, that sort of thing, is it different? Do you need to do less trauma training than if you're going to come to the provinces when you, you might be called on to do all sorts of things? I think that the Australasian system is generally very good. Trauma has always received a fairly um, a strong profile in general surgical training. Um, and I think at the end of it, because we come out as a general surgeon, here, we are competent over a variety of body um, cavities, so when the complex trauma comes in, and you know, it might go from one cavity to the other, we can usually, uh, usually cope. So that's about it. Very quick run through. Um, sorry for the speed, but hopefully we've 
just showing you some, some features of provincial trauma and from the provinces in general. Some of the different um, differences in, in the population and the makeup of trauma that we, that we get here and just give you the opportunity to have some thoughts about it. Thank you.